And with that, we'll start the presentation. So hi, my name is Amit Patel. I am a PGY2 cardiology resident here. And my pharmacotherapy rounds is bring the beat in the increasing role of rhythm control and atrial fibrillation. So start off this presentation saying that I have no personal or financial conflicts to disclose. And here are my learning objectives for your reference. So we're gonna start off this pharmacotherapy rounds with a scenario that really paints the picture of the controversy that we see in clinical practice. So we have a 55 year old male with a past medical history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with an ejection fraction of 30 to 35%. And he has mute atrial fibrillation diagnosed three months ago. And he is asymptomatic. So if you can go to slido.com at this point, I'm gonna open up this question. Hopefully can, everybody can see it and let me know if you can. So really the question here is, are we going to pursue rate control or rhythm control? And this is just act as if you are the clinician in this patient scenario, which treatment strategy would you pursue initially? Okay, so I have about 42 responses. So I have 70% doing rate control and 31% with rhythm control. Okay, so this is actually what I expected that primarily most, most clinicians would resort to rate control first, but this is really, it comes into question why this controversy is so important and the reason for this pharmacotherapy rounds in general. So for a long time, it was thought that rate control should be preferred for everyone. And as clinicians, you may have gotten used to doing rate control over rhythm control when you have patients that come in like this because really of the safety concerns that can be associated with rhythm control. But recently there's been more literature that has called this into question whether rate control really should be the first initial therapy that we are going to do for these patients. So we really should ask ourselves, should rate control be preferred or should we be thinking about rhythm control more in our patients with atrial fibrillation to solve the original problem of why they're in AFib? So we're gonna go through a roadmap throughout this presentation. We'll start with some background and current management of atrial fibrillation, then move into literature with four key landmark trials. And we'll finish with updated management and talk about early rhythm control. So we'll start with the background. So for a brief view of atrial fibrillation, AFib affects almost 44 million people worldwide and is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia in the world. Having the disease itself is an independent risk factor for cardioembolic stroke and can cause or worsen heart failure over time. And finally, atrial fibrillation can progress from paroxysmal to persistent to permanent. And this can re result in electrical and structural remodeling that can become irreversible over time. And this can be accompanied with symptoms such as rapid ventricular response, which leads to more healthcare visits, more morbidity, and some of its complications of atrial fibrillation can lead to more mortality as well. So classification of atrial fibrillation is really important to understand for the terminology when we talk about AFib literature. So I wanted to draw your attention here to paroxysmal, persistent, and long-standing atrial fibrillation, as these are the types of AFib that we'll, common, we'll talk about when we discuss the literature a little bit more in depth. So it's really important to just review treatment strategies really quickly. So I have already alluded to these, but they're rate versus rhythm. So for patients that are rate controlled, they need a slowing of the ventricular rate through drugs, through drugs such as beta blockers and non-dihydropyridines, which are diltiazem and verapamil. And this is really to increase refractoriness of conduction through the AV node to slow that rate down. And this is really, rate control is really primarily utilized to minimize the symptoms associated with the changes in heart rate and prevent excessive tachycardia in patients in their day-to-day -day activities. But it does not solve the underlying problem of what atrial fibrillation really is. And that is that erratic impulses in the atria. So rate control is really just used for symptom management. 
For rhythm control, the goal is to restore and maintain normal sinus rhythm. And it is used to convert patients back to normal sinus rhythm, relieve the symptoms associated with the core of atrial fibrillation, those erratic impulses, prevent myocardial remodeling, and overall improve quality of life. And we really do that through our antiarrhythmics and catheter ablation. And we will discuss uh, antiarrhythmics a little bit more in depth before we get into the rest of the literature. So to review antiarrhythmics briefly, it's divided up by patients, whether they have structural heart disease or no structural heart disease. And this is really defined by patients that have heart failure, coronary artery, artery disease, um, congenital and congenital disease. So in our patients that do not have structural heart disease, the um, 2014 ACC, AHA, and HRS guidelines recommend dofetilide, dronetarone, flecainide, propafenone, and sotalol. And this is not in any particular order, and it is definitely okay to switch to other classes if one class does not work. In our patients with structural heart disease, in our coronary artery disease patients, they recommend dofetilide, dronetarone, or sotalol with amiodarone as a second line options. And this is mainly due to the extra cardiac adverse effects that is associated with amio. And for our patients with heart failure, they recommend amiodarone or dofetilide as these are the only two that we can use in those patients specifically. So now let's briefly talk about the guideline recommendations. The 2020 European Society of Cardiology guidelines say that rate control is the first choice for asymptomatic patients. and they, for patients that do not have minor or no symptoms, that rate control should be the first thing that they should go to. They also recommend rhythm control or AV node ablation if there, are, if there is any LV dysfunction that is associated with these patients. And they do recognize that rhythm control is recommended for patients that have symptoms, so any of symptomatic patients, and this is a 1A recommendation. On the other hand, in the 2014 AHA ACC HRS guidelines, they actually do not specify any recommendations between rate versus rhythm control, but do recognize the importance of rhythm control. So now looking back at our roadmap, we'll now go into some of the literature associated with um, this controversy. So this is just a brief timeline to kind of put things into perspective of when this really happened. So as mentioned before, this controversy surrounding this rate versus rhythm debate and our current management with rate control being our initial strategy really stems from our early literature that occurred in 2002. So I wanted to get into more recent literature that shows us that management has really evolved over the last few decades and why there is a role for rhythm control. So now starting with rate control, why is rate control often the first line treatment strategy when patients come in with atrial fibrillation? And this really all stems back from the AFFIRM trial. So the AFFIRM trial was conducted in 2002 and published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at 2,000 patients in the rate group versus 2,000 patients in the rhythm group. Their baseline characteristics included 23% that heart, had heart failure in each group, 35% had their first episode of atrial fibrillation, and none of them had what was defined as recurrent atrial fibrillation. More than two thirds of the patients in the rhythm group were started in the antiarrhythmic drugs, were started with amiodarone or sotalol, but they were able to be switched to other drugs if needed. And the primary endpoint was that of overall mortality. And they saw that in the rate control group, 21% achieved that primary outcome of mortality or reached that primary outcome of mortality versus 24% in the rhythm group. But this was not a statistically significant finding. However, it is worth noting that there were more hospitalizations in the rhythm group due to titrations and procedures, and some of these patients did go in for ablation, so that was included in the hospitalization, um, in the increase in hospitalizations. But the rhythm group also had more adverse effects, including gastrointestinal, bradycardia, um, QTC prolongation, and a higher incidence of torsades overall. So the AFFIRM trial really helped us conclude that rhythm control does not reduce mortality compared to rate control, but it was associated with more adverse effects. 
And then the RACE trial was also conducted in 2002, just had a smaller population of patients, but it was a non-inferiority trial that was that looked at patients with recurrent or persistent atrial fibrillation. And the antiarrhythmic drugs that they used in this trial were sotalol to start, and then flecainide and propafenone if they failed sotalol, and then amiodarone if they failed these, those other two. And they really found that there was no, that rate control was not inferior to rhythm control. So from the Affirm and RACE trial, we really see that rate is preferred. And that these are from the 2002 trials that conducted this. So now looking in with Affirm and RACE, there were concerns about safety with rhythm control. And the next trial we'll really go and discuss is to investigate if a certain type of rhythm control is safe in our patients. And this is the Cabana trial. So this is rhythm control with ablation. So the population here was patients that were undergoing ablation, which is essentially a procedure that involves going into the heart and destroying some of the heart tissue to terminate the erratic impulses that are causing um, atrial fibrillation. And they compare this to rate and or rhythm group, which was the other patients were able to get rate or rhythm control in this other group. And the population was mostly proxismal, persistent, or long-standing atrial fibrillation. And the primary endpoint was a composite of death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. And they found in the ablation group that 8% met that primary outcome versus 9.2% in the drug therapy group, but this was not a statistical significant finding. So with Cabana, we really saw that there was a decrease in reoccurring atrial fibrillation with ablation, but ablation is not superior to drug therapy for cardiovascular outcomes in new onset or untreated atrial fibrillation. That was their conclusion from this trial. So with the Cabana trial, we really helped, it helped us see that ablation was safe and it did work for rhythm control. So now that we've established that rhythm control is safe, is there a certain time where rhythm control may be more effective and when should it be initiated is really the next question that we should go to. So enter early rhythm control with the East AFNET 4 trial. This was conducted in 2020 and published, it was published in 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which was, and it was the first randomized controlled trial that looked at this population of atrial fibrillation that was diagnosed within one year before randomization. So it really was the first of its kind. They looked at 1395 patients in the rate group and 1096 in the rhythm group. And their baseline characteristics included a mean age of 70 years with 38% of this population having their first episode of atrial fibrillation and 36% with their paroxysmal. So this population in general was very new to atrial fibrillation diagnosis. Only 26% of them had persistent. And the median days since diagnosis was 36 days and, and before they were randomized and 30% of them were asymptomatic. So in the rate control group, they had rate control that was at, with rhythm added if symptomatic, and this was per guideline recommendations. And in the rhythm group, they had early control with antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. And if you're wondering which antiarrhythmic drugs that they use in this trial, 36% of them got flecainide, about 20% got amiodarone, 16.7% with genetarone, and 7% with propafenone. And their, their primary outcome was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes, stroke, whether that's ischemic or hemorrhagic, or hospitalization with worsening heart failure or acute coronary syndromes. So when we look at the result, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of the primary outcome. So we see that the usual care group had a higher incidence of the primary outcome, the composite outcome, than the early rhythm control group. And they saw this was at a rate of five events for 100 patient years versus the rhythm group that was at 3.9 events per 100 patient years. And this was a statistically significant finding. It's worth noting here that this, this was a composite endpoint. That was what this Kaplan-Meier graph shows us. But the death from cardiovascular causes and the reduction of stroke as individual endpoints is what drove the statistically significant finding of the primary outcome. And the, word, and the hospitalization and worsening of heart failure and acute coronary syndromes didn't differ between the groups. And at two years, more patients were in sinus rhythm in the rhythm control group versus the rate control group. 
It is also worth noting with ESAFNET4 that the rhythm control group did have more serious adverse effects from antiarrhythmics and drug-induced bradycardia, but the primary safety outcome, which was the composite outcome that they looked at for safety, was similar between the groups. And this, the primary safety outcome was actually defined by composite death from any cause, stroke, or any adverse, effect, adverse effects related to the antiarrhythmics. So this trial really concluded that the early initiation of rhythm control therapy was associated with less frequent uh, cardio, cardiovascular events than the usual care group, but there were more safety events associated with the rhythm control group. But it was not statistically significant when we look at that primary safety outcome. So following East AFNET 4, there were a few key sub-analyses that were performed. So I'll, let me just remind you, the primary outcome was death from cardiovascular causes, stroke, or the hospitalization from acute coronary syndromes or heart failure. When they looked at a population of heart failure, this included patients that were both preserved and reduced ejection fraction. And they saw that there was a decrease in the primary outcome in the patients that had heart failure. They also looked at patients that were symptomatic versus asymptomatic, and they saw that there was a, benef a benefit in the primary outcome regardless of what symptoms that the patients were presenting with, or it, none at all. And then with the comorbidity burden, they defined comor a high comorbidity burden with a CHADS VASC of four or greater, and they saw that early rhythm control reduced the primary outcome in patients with a high comorbidity burden. So after this, the AFFIRM trial, which was published in 2002 and one of the first ones that we looked at, went back and did another sub-analysis on patients that had atrial fibrillation that was diagnosed within six months, and their primary outcome was overall mortality. And when they went back and did the sub-analysis, they actually saw that patients that were treated within six months had a decrease in mortality. So the take-home point here is that patients with heart failure, um, high com comorbidity burden, benefited from early rhythm control regardless of symptoms. So this brings us to our first checkpoint question of the session. Based on the literature presented, which of the following is true? A, rhythm control therapy, early rhythm control is associated with lower mortality. B, rhythm control has fewer safety adverse effects as compared to rate control. C, Ablation is a better rhythm control strategy to antiarrhythmic drugs. So let me go back and does that show up for everyone? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we have about 40 responses. So 90% said A, early rhythm control is associated with lower mortality, which is correct. So B is incorrect because we saw that with a firm and East AFNET 4, that there are more safety or more adverse effects associated with rhythm control as compared to rate control. And C is, is incorrect because it's not proven that ablation is a better rhythm control strategy to antiarrhythmic drugs. And the Cabana trial really tells us that they're likely equivalent. So back to our literature timeline from ESAFNET4, we see that early rhythm control is preferred. So finally, the last part of the roadmap um, and the last part of this presentation is talking about early rhythm control and what I'm proposing is updated management for our patients that are presenting with atrial fibrillation. So when we consider what factors we, sh we should think about when choosing if a patient is a good candidate for, rate for rhythm control, um, there are a few that we should really think about. And these factors I'm going to discuss are really derived from these trials that saw a benefit in the patients combined with them presenting with atrial fibrillation that's lasting less than a year or that has been diagnosed for less than a year. So these factors are my recommendations of who I would consider early rhythm control in. So first, our patients are aged less than 65. However, it is worth noting that ESAFNET4, the median age was 70. So patients older than this can still derive benefit. Patients with nowhere structural heart disease, because we are presenting 
preventing some of that structural remodeling that occurs with atrial fibrillation and would be good candidates for rhythm control before that even begins. Patients that are symptomatic, although we, it is worth noting here as well that in the East AFNET sub-analysis, asymptomatic patients may benefit as well. And this really goes back to improving quality of life too and avoiding those symptoms in the first place. Rate control that is difficult to achieve as if they are not being treated properly with the AV nodal blocking agents that we would initiate. Tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, heart failure, because this would prevent worsening heart failure and its complica complications that can lead to hospitalizations like decompensated heart failure from atrial fibrillation. Stroke risk, so patients at an increased stroke risk or who have already had multiple strokes, even on full anticoagulation, may be appropriate candidates for rhythm control. And finally, patient choice, because antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation are not benign treatments, and it, especially with antiarrhythmic drugs, it's really important to have that risk-benefit discussion, especially when initiating those drugs. So really in conclusion, if a patient has any of these factors and atrial fibrillation lasting one, less than a, one year, um, I would think that they may be good candidates for rhythm control and that should be a strategy that um, can be pursued. So in conclusion, in patients with atrial fibrillation that has not become longstanding, early rhythm control may manage symptomatic patients, reduce irreversible structural atrial cardiomyopathy, reduce stroke risk, and reduce death from cardiovascular causes. And we're really seeing these effects from the trials that are investigating this. So this brings us back to the first question that I proposed early on in this presentation. In an asymptomatic 55-year-old male patient with a mass medical history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with an EF of 30 to 35%, with new AFib diagnosed three months ago, which of the following are reasonable for an initial treatment strategy? A, rate control only, B, rhythm control with antiarrhythmic drugs, C, rhythm control with ablation, or D, all of the above. Did it work? Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so we have about 40 responses. So the correct answer is D, all of the above. And we, I see that there's 24% that said rhythm control with antiarrhythmic drugs, which is a reasonable option. And all of these are reasonable options. So although rate control is okay to use, this patient is someone that would benefit from rhythm control, especially early rhythm control. And it's important to have that shared decision-making when um, considering rhythm control. So yes, the answer is all of the above. I'd like to thank all my uh, mentors for this presentation, for creating this presentation, especially Sandeep. And I wanted to thank you all for your time and attention today. And I really hope this presentation has made you rethink rate control as a universal initial treatment strategy. And there are certain situations and patient specific considerations in which rhythm control really may make a much more of a difference in a patient. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Yes. So I'm curious in this sample patient case that you gave us where we had a patient with an ejection fraction of 30 to 35, mm -hmm. would you start rhythm control in this particular patient? Yeah, I really, I really would highly consider it just because we know that with our patients with atrial, with um, heart failure, it's a progressive disease and atrial fibrillation really can make that much worse and lead to more hospitalizations and worsening of their heart failure. So is that the worst ejection fraction you've ever seen? Probably not, but it can really help prevent that progression to worsening heart failure by treating that, um, those erratic impulses in the atria that are kind of worsening the disease already. Yes. Without getting too nitpicky, what would your personal line in the sand be for like mild structural heart disease per se? For mild structural heart disease? 
yeah, just in looking at your recommendations of patients you would consider it in, I think you had said mild structural heart disease. Yeah. So I just want, I'm curious to know what you would be defining as mild. Um, okay. So like related to like heart failure or like the other types of, I guess I'm just like wanting to, okay. I mean, that is probably the, the answer to that is probably really based on diagnostic criteria versus something that I can just say like that is probably more of a diagnostician that's able to quantify what is mild disease. But if they have had hospitalizations are coming in for their disease state and they have this atrial fibrillation that's causing these hospital visits, I think it's worth having that discussion. Like, is this, it's, is it time to treat this? And we should consider treating this because it can really worsen these cardiovascular comorbidities. And we would really want to prevent that. Does that answer your question? 